this is the Sea of Bread. Sponsored by Molson's. Celebrating 200 years, the best is yet to come. Channels 2 and 7, the television home of the Calgary Flames. In association with Olmeyer Communications. When the Flames training camp began in September in Moncton, no one really knew exactly what the National Hockey League season had in store for the team or its fans. Rajon Lemlin had just signed a new long-term contract, but there were many, many questions to be answered. Would Paul Reinhardt's back keep him out of the lineup? Who would be Lemlin's backup? Mike Vernon. Mark DeMoor, or the rookie Rich Kosky, and would rookie Gary Suter be able to make the jump from college to professional hockey? Many questions remained unanswered as the season started, but one of them was not concerning Gary Suter. Comes to McDonald over on the other side to Suter, the shot scores! What a wrist shot. I was going to say the youngster doesn't shoot enough, but I can see I was wrong. Rajon Lemlin seemed to be responding to the pressure of being the number one goaltender, losing only once in 12 starts during the month of November. Stats impressive enough to make him the National Hockey League's Player of the Month for November. Everything for the Flames seemed to be clicking as December began. Even Paul Reinhardt's return to the lineup on December 4th was a positive. Look, coming to the line, looking for uh, Reinhardt, takes the shot, scores! A week later, Rajon Lemlin posted the team's first shutout of the season. The Flames were one of the top four clubs in the National Hockey League. But then the roof fell in. Starting in Vancouver, the team lost 11 games in a row. Home ice meant nothing. Lesser teams meant nothing. Heck, even Christmas and a new year had little change on the floundering Flames. It could have been easy to make changes, but none were made, except for one. Amidst the streak, the Flames faced a touring team from the Soviet Union. The goaltender that night would be Mike Vernon. He would not disappoint. A 4-3 victory buoyed the team for a moment, but it would not be until January the 9th when the Flames ended their slump against the team that had started it back in mid-December, the Vancouver Canucks. The winning goalie, Mike Vernon. But if anyone were to pick a day of destiny for this club, it would be February 1st, 1986. Down four nothing to arch rival Edmonton, the Flames showed tremendous character. Coffee just got a piece of the puck, there's a shot, they score! Here come the Flames back again, down by three, Patterson moving in, shoot, scores! The rebound, there's a backhand, they score! Suter, McDonald in front, Quinn scores! Dan Quinn has tied it! It had been a remarkable comeback, but the night was young. General Manager Cliff Fletcher had more in his mind than a tie. After the game tonight, the Calgary Flames and St. Louis Blues completed a six-player trade. Going to St. Louis from Calgary, our left winger Eddie Beers, left winger Gino Cavallini, and defenseman Charlie Bourgeois. Coming to Calgary from St. Louis, uh, Calgarian native uh, defenseman Terry Johnson, uh, defenseman Rick Wilson, and right winger Joey Mullen. Joe Mullen and his scoring touch were the jewels of the deal. And in his first game with Calgary, he flashed his form. Throughout the month of February, the team and players made tremendous strides. Here's a break from John Mark Lundy. Vernon stopped him. Over to Mullen. Mullen moves in. Shoot scores! But still, management felt more changes had to be made. On March 11th, Steve Conroy and Rich Crum became New York Islanders. The newest flame was John Tonelli. 
Yeah, I'm looking forward to playing in uh, Calgary. Really, I really am. Uh, I know there's a good uh, group of fans there and uh, real supportive, and uh, I'm glad to be part of the organization. It also appeared from that point the Flames had a new starting goaltender. Young Mike Vernon would not lose a start for the rest of the season. As the team prepared to enter the playoffs, everything appeared to be in order. Except they had not beaten the Stanley Cup champion Edmonton Oilers in seven starts. That streak would end on April 4th with a decisive 9-3 victory at the Saddle Dome. For Flames fans, the night belonged to Gary Suter, who had a team record six assists. To others, the night belonged to Wayne Gretzky, who set yet another single-season scoring record. 80 games had been played, 89 points won. And this club, whose time of reckoning was upon them, had set new power play and shorthand goal markers. As long as the season had been, it all started to be worth it as the second season began. Any success of the regular season would have been useless if the Flames had been eliminated early in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Memories of losing in four games to Winnipeg in 1985 had haunted the team for 12 months. Revenge, as it turned out, would be short and sweet. After two uneventful victories at the Saddle Dome behind the goaltending of Mike Vernon, the series moved to Winnipeg for the Jets' only home game of the playoffs. It went into overtime, and the old man took advantage. The two veterans, Tanelli and McDonald across the line. The pass to McDonald shoots. He scores! Lady McDonald and the Flames have won by a final score of 4-3. to A three-game sweep of the Jets set up what every Flame fan wanted yet feared. A Smite Division final against the Edmonton Oilers. It would be two weeks of memorable hockey history for Calgarians. As the series started, no one knew just how great the hockey and the intensity would be. But it was a natural rivalry. The two goaltenders were old foes. The two coaches were hardly similar. And the cities had always been great rivals. For John Tonelli, it was his first game for the Flames against the Oilers. But by the end of period one of game one, you wouldn't have known it. He brings it out for Calgary, puts on the brakes, looking in front, goes cross ice. Out front to Suter, he scores! At the other end, Mike Vernon kept up his steady play as the Flames' last defense. And every member of the team made sure the Oilers' potent attack got few, if any, second chances. Here's McSorley moving in, plus save by Vernon. Better hit the coffee, going in alone. Saved by Vernon, he got a piece of it. What a great opportunity for the Edmonton Oilers and Vernon is hurt. But the injury wouldn't hurt Vernon or the Flames this night. Fate, it seemed, was wearing red. Glenn Anderson's goal in the last minute of the second didn't give the Oilers any help as the Flames sealed it in the third. Now here's Papinski, feeding it out front, they score! Beautiful setup, and Mullen finally cashed it after being foiled in the second. All night long, the Flames had bottled up the Edmonton skaters at the blue line. Calgary played like a team possessed against Gretzky and company. In front of Curry. Curry was tied up by Lou. Couldn't get a shot away. Lou has been very effective tonight. Lead pass for Wilson. Wilson dropping it back. Lou moving in. Scores! It was maybe the Flames' best effort under Bob Johnson. Certainly the most complete. As a confidence builder, the 4-1 win was great medicine, but it was only the first for the Flames in an unforgettable fortnight. Game two marked Rajon Lemlin's 86 playoff debut. It seemed that Mike Vernon's left knee needed a night off. Lemlin, certainly under pressure, seemed to respond. The side of the net, Bradley Fates won, took the shot, got it again, took another shot. It's loose in front of the net. And the Flames have done an excellent job again of covering up. Back to the point. Over to Coffey, a shot right on, and the puck was cleared. But this was a different Oiler team than in game one. They appeared much more prepared for the Flames' tough style. As for the Flames, they appeared to be just as aggressive. He scores! The teams went to the second period tied at one. 
What followed was a 20-minute session of bounces and miscues that had the Flames ahead by two. to the center ice area. Again, you saw Suter coming up late. They score! Would you believe it? On the right side, Otto in the slot to Mala. He scores! But the order scoring machine could only be silenced for so long. It didn't take them long to get started in the third. McTavish into the slot. Even Flames general manager Cliff Fletcher sensed the inevitable. Kershelniski going after the loose puck. They score! Drop pass for Hunter. A shot scored! It marked the first time in the series the Flames had trailed. Bob Johnson's timeout with less than two minutes to play corrected that. One twenty-nine left in the third. From the face off, it goes to the side of the net. Bobby around on the board, but not up. Reinhardt keeps it in. Rise for with a shot on the side, and they score! Oh. But this game was not to be the Flames. Just 104 into overtime, the Oilers tied the series. Anderson was tied up. Lovely gets it to Anderson again. Anderson scores! But the Flames and their fans had proved something. This was to be a long series and at times agonizing. It was a series, too, that Calgary fans would leave As their mark. They have hat trick fever here in Edmonton. Calgary fans might respond with something of their own for games three and four. They'll probably uh, show up in a sea of red. I'm sure. And so it was. As the series moved to the Saddle Dome, the fans in Calgary gave the hockey world the first look at the Sea of Red. But it would be the night of goaltenders. Mike Vernon returned to guard the flame goal, and Grant Fuhr was simply awesome for the Oilers. As they had in the first two games, Calgary scored first. Now Tonelli, the Ryan Ryder, is trying to score! It was a power play goal, and so was the Oilers' first tally in the last minute of the period. The draw comes back to Gretzky. He winds up the shot on and scores! Period two saw the Flames take over this night. Out shooting the Oilers 16-4, Calgary had only Grant Fuhr in the way of a route. Like any mortal, Fuhr could only do so much himself. At 9.59 of the period, the bubble burst with Colin Patterson's great hustle. And across the line, they're going for the net, a backhand shot. They score on the rebound. Soon the frustration of being out-hustled started to show on Gretzky and company. The Oilers had only one shot in the last 10 minutes of the period. Glenn Anderson's goal early in the third made it 2-2, which lasted exactly six minutes and 16 seconds. Drop right back in by Jamie McCowan with Mullins and McCowan, McCowan going in. From that point on, it became pure against the world once more. Oh, takes the shot, the save by Pure, the puck was loose at the side of the net. Back to the point, 
A drive, and that's kicked out by Gure. Gets it back again for Gary Wilson. Wilson, backhand shot. And the Jack receives. The save by Grant Gure. He wasn't sure where that puck was. Only once did the Oilers come and close. Quick shot. Vernon got a piece of it and juggled it and then grabbed it again. When it was over, the Flames fans had seen what they wanted. A 3-2 Flame victory outshooting Edmonton 38-19 and a lead in the series. Saddle Dome began almost the same as Game 3. Grant Fuhr was great. But for Bob Johnson and the Red Clad Flames fans, this would be a frustrating night. Wayne Gretzky finally played the way everyone knew he could, and for the first time, the Oilers scored the first goal of the game. And just 20 seconds later, it would be 2-0. The second period started much better for Calgary in typical Flames style. But on this night, Edmonton would always come back. The Flames' power play would be a factor as well. Calgary had 13 man advantage situations, yet at times it was the Oilers who were on the attack. Messier gets it ahead to Gretzky. Gretzky crosses the line, and again he circles back, coming on time to Yari Curry now. Quick shot score! And if it wasn't Gretzky, it was Craig McTavish or Grant Fuhr. Comes up front to Trailing 4-3 in the third, Calgary tried to force a tie, only to fall victim to a familiar fall. He's got a breakaway. Gretzky going in. He scores. Gretzky with the shot and scores. The final score would be 7-4 Oilers. The best of seven series had become a best of three, and Wayne and his friends were going home. As the series moved back to Northland's Coliseum for Game 5, it appeared that the status quo had returned. The Oilers, live with their third Stanley Cup, would continue if they could play as well as they did in Game 4. Except someone forgot to tell the Calgary Flames. Here's Glenn Anderson going for the net. Anderson holds it, and Vernon went down to make the save. Forced back into his own zone, right drop. And flipped over top of the net by Tonelli. The first save made by Fjord on a point blank shot. Up front again, another save, another shot by McDonald. They bang away at the side of the net. Gretzky has it out front. Kershwinski with a shot. It's juggled and goes over the top of the net. Going in is Barazan. Barazan clipped the shot. He fired it high. Bounces away from McDonald. Gretzky with a shot. Saved by Vernon. Dan Quinn hadn't played since game two of the series, and he, like the Flames, had something to prove. He did just that in the last minute of period one. Tied up by Greg, it comes back to McCollin, a shot right on the score! The Oilers got that goal back five minutes into the second period. Wayne Gretzky was one Oiler who was not going to go down without a fight. But for another Oiler, tonight would be the end of the season. It is both free by the plane. They bring it out to center. Oh, what a collision! Fogelin stepped in the center, and Fogelin is hurt. Oiler defenseman Lee Fogelin wouldn't return for the rest of this or any other game in the series. His Charlie horse was too severe. That fact seemed to inhibit the Oilers and inspire the Flames. The rise round, and McDonald's will try to score! For Joel Otto, he's been trying to score! 
Now, just 20 minutes of hockey stood between the Flames and a 3-2 lead in the series. Glenn Sather knew it, and so did Mike Vernon. Over to Gretzky, Gretzky moving in, in front, and with Vernon out of position, Anderson couldn't get a stick on it. Here's a shot saved by Vernon. From the faceoff. Coffee with a shot. Oh. What a save by Vernon. Game five will end 4-1 for the Flames. Just one victory separated Calgary from the biggest upset in the franchise's history. If Game 5 was the best hockey of the series, then certainly Game 6 against the Oilers was the most emotional, both high and low. minutes into the second, it appeared that every Flames fan's dream would come true. Sutter, the ball on the shot to save it, he made it for it! Right down, over for Tanani, he As is the tendency in sports, there is always a turning point. This night was no different. Take it, and shot and before the second period was over, the Oilers had taken advantage of a fragile Calgary power play. And a man named Fuhr decided to play like a man possessed. Here's a chance now for Poplinski in across the line with move. Poplinski holds him, takes the shot, let him take the rebound. And Pure makes another save while he was down. As the third period began, Bob Johnson knew his team did not have the momentum, nor did they have the crowd who sensed the inevitable. But they did have Mike Vernon. Curry going in alone. Hook check. Rebound. Fire wide by Messier. Napier going in. A shot saved by Vernon. McTavis steals it. Vernon's work had been remarkable. This had been his best night of the playoffs yet. But this was also Walter Gretzky's first visit to Alberta for a playoff game in 1986, and his son rarely loses when dad watches. So the series was tied. The Oilers would score two more in the last minute of play for a 5-2 victory. Calgary had lost a chance to eliminate the Oilers from the Stanley Cup playoffs, but they still had one more crack, and it would be in a building that had been quite friendly to the Flames. Only time would tell. It was hard to believe that these two teams had been at each other's throats for two weeks now. The Flames coaching staff of Johnson, Murdoch, and Paget's preparation for the Oilers had been tremendous, but it would mean little without a victory. Glenn Sather had finally been receiving some credit as a fine coach. It too would mean little without a victory in Game 7. The first period was as pensive as any in the series. The difference in the first 20 minutes would be the Flames' ability to control the Oilers' power play. Bozak controlling it, putting on the brakes, the shot, and a glove save. Here's a two-on-one for the Flames. Rise, Brown, and Lou. In across the line for Lou, he scores! The Oilers had brought Game 6 good luck charm Walter Gretzky to Northlands, but that didn't seem to stop Jim Poplinski's great second effort. It bounces high. Grant Fuhr is in. Grant Fuhr unable to control it. 
Klinsky battled with him. But the Flames had been up two goals in two previous games that they lost, games two and six. As fate would have it, game seven would give hints of the same. Gretzky moving in, Bates gets it across, they score! Here's a chance for both and the shot. Your way out of the net to make the save. Lead pass, here's a breakaway for Messier. Messier going in, he's going! As the third period began, no one knew what to expect, and the period lived up to expectations. Gretzky with Crucial Nitsky. Over to Napier. Napier with the shot. Vernon out of the net to make the save. Vernon came out to challenge that time, as Grant Fuhrer did in the second period on Steve Bozak. Oh, they score! Oh, Steve Smith, in attempting to get it out of his own zone, put it in the net. No matter how many times you looked at it, the puck still went into the net. It would be a bitter pill to swallow for young Steve Smith, but hardly bitter for any Flames fan. Still, there was 15 minutes left to play after Barrison's goal, and plenty of chances at both ends. Back to the goal, loses it up front! Almost converted it. Comes back to the line. Greg is unable to keep it in. Here's a three on one. Rise round. Still going for the net. Rise round out front. Saved by Fuhrer. They get it again. Bounces off the leg. Rise round gets a club saved by Grant Fuhrer. As the period wore down, it was the Flames who became the aggressor and the Oilers and their fans more worried. Finally, it came down to one last gasp for the Oilers. It's dropped. Kept in by Coffey. Here comes Fuhrer. Over to Curry. Curry, he tried to go cross ice to Gretzky. It bounced away from him. I don't know why he didn't shoot him. And for Bob Johnson and the Flames, life ended as cannon fodder for the Oilers. The Flames were doormats no more. Fate indeed. War red. Neshe on the faceoff, passes off to Coffee. He shot it wide, and the Flames have got it! Yeah, baby! The Flames have tied them up! They have beat the end of the Lord by a score of three to two, and they win the series! The Flames and so an era had ended, and maybe a new one was beginning. The Flames to a player had given more to this series than any other time in their careers. Oh sure, there would be more, but this would be the sweetest victory of all. Just two nights after defeating the Oilers, Calgary began the Campbell Conference Championship against the St. Louis Blues. For Terry Johnson and Joe Mullen, they'd be facing the team that traded them three months earlier. For that matter, the Blues would have four X-Flames in their lineup. As the series began, most could not believe the difference in pace from the Oilers series. But the roles had changed. Bob Johnson's Calgary Flames were the favorites, the team with speed. Jacques Demers' Blues were the hard-checking underdogs. And the Sea of Red? Oh, it was still celebrating the Oilers series. In the corner, Reed's persistent, gets it again. Reed surfing in front for Cavalini to score! And from the looks of it, so were the Flames. If not for the work of Mike Vernon, the Flames would have been down more than just one goal. 
It was not the place Gary Suter wanted to be, but a knee injury late in Game 7 versus Edmonton put the rookie in the press box for the rest of the playoffs. How much difference he would have made is something all Flames fans have an opinion on. McKinnis drives it back of the goal again. Out front, they score! Reinhardt shoots, it goes wide. The Flames' small outburst in the second period gave Bob Johnson some comfort going into the third, but certainly it would not be enough. The Blues' control of this game's tempo was never in doubt. It was only a matter of time before they got the goals they needed. Bell keeps it in at the point. Wickenheiser goes back to the net up front. They score! Reed! Drops it off for Hunter. Hunter in across the line. Splits the defense going in. Score! The goals were just minutes apart late in the third. And despite Hulken Lube's partial break in the dying minutes, Calgary never came close to breaking Rick Walmsley's jinx over the Flames. The final was 3-2 Blues, and a whole city held its breath, hoping this was not an omen of things to come. Game two would provide some interesting events for the Flames and their fans. It marked the return to the lineup of Mike Eves, who had retired as a player during the 1985 training camp in Moncton. It also marked the end of Rick Walmsley's seven-game unbeaten streak at the Saddle Dome, although the night did not start that way. Long shot kicked out. But this night would belong to Flame veteran Doug Reisbrock, who was reunited with John Canelli and Lanny McDonald to lead a red wave of goal scoring at Blues Netminder. Working against the beast, gets away, scores! Sheehy winds up. Right in front, they score, Reisbrock! Quinn, back to the point with seven seconds. A long shot, deflected, the rebound, they score! Bozak in front, a shot, they score, Patterson. Reinhardt to Quinn, he scores. For Berezan to Colin Patterson, back to McKinnis, a shot, he scores. It was a night the power play went four for nine, and Mike Vernon had only 20 shots. The Flames were going to St. Louis on a roll. As the sign in the Flames room at the arena in St. Louis said, the countdown to Calgary's first Stanley Cup was at seven. But this St. Louis team would have plenty to say before any championship could be celebrated by the Calgary Flames. It was a special day for this man. Not only was Joe Mullen returning to St. Louis, but his wife gave birth earlier in the day to their third child. Joe waited all of 20 seconds to celebrate. The McKenna's the shot he scores! Mullen's goal was on the power play, as were two others of the period. Tried to get it back to the point to Ramage. He couldn't get a shot away. Fed it over to Benning. He takes a shot. They score! Federico on the deflection. He'll try again. Lanny McDonald scores. Period two began 2-1 for the Flames, and it was McDonald's regular line mates, John Tonelli and Doug Reisbrow, who extended the Flames' lead in the second. And across the line, Reisbrow going to the net over for Tonelli. Scores! Loop with Reisbrow. For Reisbrow, he scores! Short-handed goal for But it would be the Blues rookie, Brian Benning, who would score the next goal. And it would put the Blues down only by one and put the fans back in the game. Greg 
Chuck Demers timeout with just under two minutes to play set up a last gasp for the home team. A gasp that never really got going. Shot from the line, knocked down, and here's a chance now for Patterson, the empty net, he scores! So the Flames regained home ice advantage in the series. They were just two games away from advancing to the Stanley Cup final, but the series was far from over. Blues coach Jacques Demers had berated his club for sloppy play in game three, and for game four, he wanted them to play more aggressive. He also put Rick Walmsley back in goal. Both moves seemed to pay off. McKinnis at the line, over to Reinhardt. Reinhardt, rink wide to Quinn, shot right on the rebound, Mullen fires it wide. Big rebound, open net, Mullen fired it wide. McKinnis with a blast, saved by Wamsley, an opening, and the Blues dump it down the ice. Well, so far... The key play in this game wouldn't be a goal, nor a save. It was this errant stick to Joe Mullen's lip. Forced to play without their top scorer, the Flames fell behind early, and never recovered. There's a goal from the faceoff. Hunter letting that shot go. And he blasted it. Kevin LaValle looking back to the point, now drops it off for Ragland. In front, they score! As the oldest member of the Blues, it would be Rick Mahar who spurred his teammates on in game four. Despite Joey Mullins' return in the second period, the Blues just kept rolling. The line to Norwood. Norwood takes a shot high up on Vernon's chest. Another shot, they score! Lanny McDonald's eighth and ninth goals of the playoffs, both on the power play, kept the Flames in the game. But sandwiched between them was the key play of the contest. Picked off by Natras with Mahar. Mahar going in, he scores! So the series was tied at two, and the Blues fans knew yet another game would be played at the arena. As game five began, every Flame fan knew that this was the game the Flames had to win. A trip back to St. Louis down a game was hardly an advantageous position, and the Flames played that way. They were certainly more aggressive than any previous game of this series. Even the penalty killing, which was perfect in eight situations this night, was aggressive. Trying to go in, saved by Wamsley, rebound, they score! And Mike Vernon was, well, Mike Vernon. He tries to go around, leads up front, and a sliding save by Vernon, and Dragon is coming in from the wing. A shot from the point, high up the rebound, and a save by Vernon. Wickenheiser back to the net up front, a shot, Vernon the save. With Harry Wilson, who was minus his spleen looking on, the Flames appeared to be in total control until Doug Gilmore's goal early in the second. But hard work, fine passing, and a little bit of luck would put the Flames back on top. Mullen had difficulty controlling that pass, but gets it back to Reinhardt. Toronto in front, they score quick! Back at the line, McKinnis with a shot. Rick Wamsley continued his impressive play against the Flames, but he couldn't do it all himself. Mark Hunter's goal nine minutes into the third period would move the Blues within one goal, but it would be the last shot on Mike Vernon for the night, even on the power play. 117 now left in the power play. Long pass, knocked down in the neutral zone by Patterson. Finally Benning for St. Louis shoots it in. 5.05 left in the period. However, the Flames get it, and McCowan drives it the length of the ice. And again, the Calgary Flames are really throwing a quip into the power play plans of the St. Louis Blues. 
The game ended 4-2 for Calgary. They would go to St. Louis to win the series in six games and rest for the finals. Or at least that was the plan. Nothing had to be said to Bob Johnson and the Flames. Winning game six would give the team a chance to rest and prepare for the Montreal Canadiens who are waiting to start the Stanley Cup final. Losing to the Blues would mean a seventh game and only a day of rest before the Stanley Cup if they won game seven. After a scoreless first period, Paul Reinhardt quarterback the Flames power play to a lead. Across the line, trying to set something up for Mullen. Mullen across ice, they score! Dan Quinn got there to take that centering pass and knock it in. Eves couldn't control it. It comes back to the line now. Reinhardt, Reinhardt moving in. Over to Quinn. He scores! Dan Quinn's fine finishing touch gave the Flames a lead of two goals just two minutes into period two. Cliff Ronning responded for the Blues before the Flames attacked again. 45 remaining from the faceoff. The puck is loose. A shot. They score! Calgary had a lot of shots in the power play, and St. Louis continued to take penalties. Tonelli scores as that puck came loose from the faceoff, and Tonelli, cruising through, rifled it past Wombley. So it was 4-1 Calgary after two periods. Doug Wickenheiser and Joe Mullen exchanged goals early in the third period. With just under 12 minutes to play, the faces told the story. Calgary ahead by three, it must be over for St. Louis. But the line of Sutter, Puzlowski, and Gilmore kept the Flames from winning game six. Puzlowski with a long shot, the big rebound, they score, Sutter! Like a center, they score! Here's the shot by Puzlowski, the rebound, and Vernon covers up. Vernon stops it back to the net, picked up there by McCallum, they score! So Jacques Demers' Blues had forced overtime in dramatic fashion. It would take just one good scoring chance, and both sides had that and more. Mullen comes up with it, a shot right on as Wamsley went down. Mullen with a long shot, he hit the post. Picked off by Federko, Federko going in over to Hunter, a shot, rebound, they score! Doug Wickenheiser left the Flames with a quiet charter flight home. Thoughts of arrest before Montreal had been replaced. Now the thoughts were simply those of survival. team received the welcome that this team did before game seven against the Blues. Perhaps it was in response to the great crowds of St. Louis. And perhaps it was a small gesture, a sign of appreciation of what was. Any way you looked at it, it was long and loud. In return, the Flames responded with a complete effort. Here's a two-on-one. Federko coming in. He tried to slide it across. McCowan broke it up. Lanny McDonald back with that crank and move off front. It comes down. Patterson with a shot. Knocked down. Loose in front. There's a chance for it. Oh, back. Save. The 
Flames led by one going into the second and never let up the pressure. Reinhardt fakes the shot. Gets it over to Reisbrow, a weak shot knocked down. Reisbrow gets it again, a shot knocked down in front of the net. As the Flames storm that St. Louis goal. McDonald trying to get it out. He's checked, far along the board. Not able to get it out. Patterson with Shakespeare! Just minutes fell between the Flames and a berth in the final with the Canadians now. All night, they had held the Blues to just 18 shots on Mike Vernon. One of the last was by Eddie Beers. With two minutes to play, it was 2-1 Calgary. Six seconds remaining, the Flames fire the puck down the ice. And it goes all the way down off the boards in front of the net. And there's the game in. The celebration was complete and justified. A team given long odds of making it to the conference championship had won it. The team and the town were now going to the pinnacle of Canadian sports. They were going to play for the Stanley Cup. series started, some interesting stories surrounded the Flames. They were entering the series on just one day's rest. For Doug Reisbrow, it marked his return to a final after a six-year absence. Back then, he played for the Canadians. And Lanny McDonald was making his first final appearance of his 13-year career. The series also featured two goaltenders and two coaches who had never been in a final before. Smith. At the side of the net for Naslin, back and shot, he scores! Montreal opened the scoring in the series, but the emotion of the franchise's first final and the great Saddledome support made tired legs strong as the Flames dominated the well-rested Canadians. Now it's Lovato, going to the corner, back to the point for Baxter, with a shot! Stolen by Quinn, a shot scored! A shot scored! McDonald! Bob Johnson had to be impressed with his club's resiliency. To play this strong on pure emotion had to be a positive sign. And as a last defense, there was always Mike Vernon. To the line, Robinson winds up, high shot held by Vernon. Robinson left again, shot saved. Big rebound, and it's gathered in by Lou. Reisbrow's empty net goal capped an impressive night for the Flames. Now just three games away from the Stanley Cup, and the hockey world on the edge of its seat, looking west to Calgary. Game two brought with it tremendous confidence for the Flames and their fans. No one suspected that this fan's pregame antics of talking to his goalposts would stand between the Flames and the Stanley Cup. No one suspected, especially after the team controlled both ends of the ice. Jen Grau with another shot. The rebound, Bobby Smith trying to jam it as Brown scrolls at the post. Tonelli takes the shot, going in, the shot is McDonald feeds it ahead to Reinhardt, going in, scores! Fifteen seconds into the second period, Calgary had a two-goal lead. And as dominant as Calgary had been early, Montreal began taking control of the game. The turning point was Montreal's first goal. Jim Brown, moving in, getting into the spot, he shoots his goal! 
Gaston Gingras had to be the Canadian's unsung hero of Game 2. But as the replay showed, it was the fine crossbody blocked by Chris Nyland on Mike Vernon that gave Gingras the chance at an open net. Early in the third period, David Maley scored his first playoff goal to tie the game at two. Victory had seemed so close for the Flames, now it was in doubt. Thank goodness for Mike Vernon and his goal posts. Break wide, Dindra shot, saved by Vernon. To the point, Dindra with the shot wide, that's with the shot, saved by Vernon. Drop pass, Nylon off the post. What a shot by Chris Nylon, that hit the post. Through traffic, another shot, and Nylon again hits the post. Vernon's heroics forced overtime. To this day, half of the Saddledome crowd have not seen the goal. For the Flames, it was nine seconds in hell. From the face-off, McPhee brings it in with Skrutha, and he scores! As quickly as Brian Skrutha scored in Game 2, the momentum changed in the final series. The Canadians now had home ice and what appeared to be fresher legs. They also had Patrick Roy. Holland goes to center, the left wing feed to Barazan. He scoots into the Canadian zone by Chelios. He's ready to the shot, and the save made by Waugh. Drive by McGinnis, and that one is blocked by Waugh. In front, a shot by Barazan. Waugh, another save. Pass out front, backhand shot, save Waugh. And the puck bouncing around in front of the goal, finally corralled by the Canadian goaltender as Hogan Lube getting a scoring opportunity. For the Flames, it was the debut of Brett Hull. And it was almost unforgettable. Reinhardt over to the other side to McGinnis. McGinnis into Hull. Hull shoots. Scores! Hit the, post, hit the goal post. Look for a moment as Owen went in. But the puck clears off the goal post at Brett Hull. Rolling that shot from the face-off circle. He's reputed to have a great shot, and he shows it right there. Two goals by the Flames on the power play in the first period had the club ahead by one with just under two minutes left in period one. But then the roof fell in. Maslin, who scored for the Canadians earlier with the puck inside the line of Robinson. Shot. Score! Bobby Smith. The game tied again. 2 2. Chelios winds up that big shot on goal. Save Vernon. Rebound. Save. May Vernon. Another shot. They score! But Noslin. And Canadians lead it for the first time. It's 3 2. Now they move to the attack again. The shot. They score! Bob Beatty. And Canadians lead it. It's now 4 2. Game three was gone. The weary Flames began to show the fatigue of two consecutive seven-game series. And despite a third power play goal, the Flames could not respond to the three goals in 68 seconds that ended the first. And when it rains, well, you know the old saying, and so do the Flames. Mullen in there with Shangra, and Shangra hitting Mullen, and Mullen is hurt as he goes down. So when Bob Johnson looked out onto the ice for game four, Joe Mullen would not be dressed. He also had a decision to make in goal. Rajon Lemlin finished game three and played well. But Johnson stayed with Mike Vernon, who turned in a strong game, as did the man at the other end, Patrick Roy. In the end, Flames fan or not, the Canadians would not give up. Here come the Canadians into the Flames on Gini, the slap shot. He hit the goal post. Rebound caroms all the way out into the center ice area. Puck loose there, Scrudlin has it. Scrudlin shoved off the puck immediately by Hunter and fetching the puck for Calgary, Dougie Reisbrow. Reisbrow pass, intercepted. Lemieux with a chance, he's right in the drive. He scores! Long oh, Lemieux, one nothing, Montreal! And one was all they would need. It had been a long time since the Moncton training camp, and everyone had to be wondering if this hockey season would be ending on this Saturday night. To be sure, the Canadians wanted the series over. Joe Mullen would be back, and Paul Baxter would be hitting. But would it be enough? Outside into the slot, score! Again, it was the unsung Canadian that put Montreal ahead. But it was a heralded rookie that kept them there. Baxter with a shot, and Patrick Waugh, McKinnis with another shot, hit the post. Waugh's talks with the post must have worked. After Steve Bozek and Brian Scrudlin scored, it was Waugh and his posts that stopped the game from being tied. Two on one, Mullen with a shot, the save by Patrick Waugh. At the other end, 
Flames rookie Mike Vernon was not to be outdone. But the Canadians continued to force the issue in the Flames zone. Goals just 19 seconds apart made it 4-1 Montreal. But the character of the Flames was not to roll over and play dead. This team had gone through a lot to get to this point. And for some players, like Steve Bozek, this was to be their shining moment. Bozek was playing perhaps the game of his life. His two goals in Game 5 gave record to this fact. For the remainder of the game, the pressure was strictly on the shoulders of Patrick Roy and his teammates. Back to the point. McKinnis with a shot to Quinn. And he couldn't get it up and over. Mullen shot scores! The Flames dream was not to be. Yet while the team congratulated the new champions, it was the Flames fans who responded with the series' most emotional chord. Well, it feels awfully nice, and we feel bad that we didn't capture the ultimate prize, the Stanley Cup, for them. Uh, but uh, we, we gained a wealth of experience out there, and it's something that uh, only the guys in the room know what exactly uh, uh, happens. And, and it's something that we'll want to come back and try and share with each other again. Uh, you know, it, it's very disappointing. It was hard to believe watching the Civic response that this team fell three games short of its goal. 125,000 Flames fanatics lined the streets, partly to salute the team, partly to celebrate the promise the team demonstrated. And in the weeks to come, the attitude of confidence and winning that this team gave 700,000 citizens was tremendous. As the NHL prepared itself for a summer, yet another reminder of what the Calgary Flames future holds took place in Toronto. Gary Suter. Gary Suter's Calder Trophy win just capped a season to remember for the Flames and their fans. And as new seasons come and go, the reality of the 1985-86 season as one of triumph will only be a list of words and numbers in a record book. But the memories for the team and the town will live forever. The stories will recount some tremendous athletic feats, great personal triumphs, and above all, a great love affair between the players wearing the Red Sea and the Sea of Red. Winning a Stanley Cup will have to wait, but winning a whole city was almost as much fun.